Hello and good morning. Hello, everyone. We are very, very happy that you are joining us today from all over Central Europe. So today is the moment that we are actually we were waiting for because we are kickstarting the new generation of the programs for 21-27. And we also start our first call. My name is Dana Kaščakova. I work as the, inter, as the communication manager at the Interreg Central Europe Secretariat in Vienna. And together with my colleagues, who you do not see, who are in the back end, we will be uh, taking care that you have an informative event today. So what is really the event about? In this 90 minute session, you can imagine that we will probably have no time to go into the details. However, we hope that we pre prepare for you, we have prepared for you a good mix of information so that you are well informed about what is going on with the first call. As the first session, we have invited guests representing the European Commission, representing the program member state and the managing authority, who will talk to us a little bit about the future and how it went with preparation of the program. Then we will have the keynote presentation by Luca Ferrarese, the head of our secretariat, who will be giving you the main feature of the call. And uh, last but not least, of course, we have also invited one of you uh, who is with us uh, uh, with the projects already running in the current period, but who is also preparing a new idea for the future program. So this is the rough plan for the 90 minutes. And before I give the floor to the first speaker, I would like to also spend a few sentences about where we actually meet. You know that seven years ago, we met in Vienna in a wonderful city hall in, um, and could invite more than 500 people in physical event. This is unfortunately not possible this time, but um, from the pandemic, we learn a lot. So we try to face the challenges and these challenges also mean new opportunities. And the new opportunity for us is actually this very platform where we meet, our applicant community. And as we call it, the applicant community is the best start for you to start the cooperation. We have launched it in June this year, and we are very proud that actually today, more than 2000 people joined the platform. So this is why we think and believe that this is the good start for your cooperation, because the platform offers you vast opportunities to network, to connect with each other, to also share your ideas. And not only that, you can also uh, meet and it is also a place for us where we can offer you event as such. So there will be more events coming your way. So just as a first hint, for these 90 minutes, we will basically go through the key features and later on um, during the coming three months when you will be developing your ideas, there will be more events coming your way. So first of all, also what you can see now on your screen is the stage where we will meet our guests and we will share, this, share the slides with you. And on the right side hand, you can also see the Slido. I can see that many of you already are using the slide already. So uh, what about the first poll maybe? It's not just a question and a question that you can pose through Slido, but we can also uh, interact with you and you can engage with us. And we already have a new poll launched. And here we wanted to know actually whether you are new to the Interreg Central Europe program. So I can see already people are answering and it's like, wow, 330 people are already connecting via Slido with us. Thank you very much for that. I can see that we have a majority of people uh, who were with us, but it's just 55%. So we also aim to reach to newcomers. And it seems that this was a good step because we have now currently 45% of people being the new. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite my first guest, 
of today, Karolina Jasinska mulek Hello, Karolina. Hello, Dana. Good morning to everyone. You are connecting from Brussels, right? Yes, indeed. Gray sky or is it raining? Yeah, typical foggy weather <laughs> as we like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. But now also in Vienna, it's very similar. Yeah. Um, Carolina, you are our desk officer and you're working for the European Commission at the DG Regio. And um, my, my question to you would be actually linked um, to um, the program as such, because Interreg Central Europe is rather a low budgeted program. And at the commission, you are dealing also with the bigger structural funds programs. And um, um, the question would be, how can such a small uh, program also contribute to wider policies on a European level? So, uh, do you have maybe an idea what you can share with our audience today? Well, uh, indeed, uh, Interreg's budget for the next seven years um, amounts to roughly 8 billion euro. So it may seem little when we compare it to the huge envelope of the cohesion policy, which is almost 400 billion. But uh, we need to see actually Interreg uh, in the context of uh, it being part of the cohesion policy, but uh, which is by the way, the main investment policy of the union, but also an instrument of, of many that uh, the European Union is uh, funding. So um, yes, Interreg uh, has got perhaps a meager endowment but uh, in my view, its biggest values does not lie in funding heavy investments, which is often the case of uh, other instruments. We uh, rather expect it to complement bigger investments, or I would even say enable them by preparing the grants and uh, building capacity for wider policy action. But also by looking for novel approaches uh, to address complex challenges, uh, which might actually be riskier and need to be tested before they are upscaled. So in fact, um, in our view, cooperation can lead to better and more, more cost effective projects, for instance, through joint investments to avoid duplication or co-designing uh, to benefit from a wider knowledge, or through organized responses to challenges which affect more than uh, a country. So as such, uh, Interreg is expected to make other public policies more effective as uh, most challenges cannot actually be addressed in isolation and require coordinated action in uh, given geographical areas. So now we are asking what is on the European agenda where Interreg can do its bit. In fact, um, the cohesion policy itself has already a strong impact in many fields and helps to deliver also other EU policies, uh, such as those uh, which deal with education, employment, energy, the environment, the single market or uh, research and innovation. And at the same time, the projects which are financed uh, by the European cohesion um, policy, including uh, Interreg in the regions and cities, should also contribute to those wider um, uh, commission priorities, which have been set now for 2019-2024. And let me name here uh, in particular uh, three of them, uh, the European Green Deal, <clears throat> a Europe which is fit for digital age, and an economy that works for people, where the cohesion policy is um, particularly active. In addition, uh, now following the outbreak of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, the recovery plan has been added on the EU agenda, as we all know, to help uh, our societies and the economies to recover from the crisis that the pandemic provoked. And here again, the cohesion policy is called to contribute, including uh, the interact action. So in short, the European policies with Interreg should bring us on the way to a post-COVID Europe, uh, which we all hope to be greener, uh, more digital, and also better fitting uh, for challenges, challenges 
while at the same time uh, respecting the European uh, values. And uh, we know we don't have much time for this, uh, especially as we look at the ambitious agenda set for the Green Deal and the actual agency of the climate action, as we have been reminded uh, this week at the closure of the Glasgow um, Climate Conference. And it's in fact the climate change, which is the biggest challenge of our times, the Green Deal uh, will, de will remain the compass for each European policy and should also be the guiding principle for cooperation programs. So in this context, let, let me uh, to recap the main objectives of the Green Deal. So first of all, we want uh, our continents to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Uh, to do that, we need to decouple economic growth from the use of resources and all this uh, while ensuring that no person and no place are left behind. So we want a transition which uh, is just and inclusive. Obviously, uh, those objectives can be only achieved uh, through a series of uh, coherent and coordinated actions. Uh, both legislative and non-legislative at uh, all the levels, starting from the EU through macro-regional, uh, transnational, national, regional and local. And obviously the transnational cooperation projects uh, have to bring their contribution uh, in this respect. And uh, finally, uh, let me give you some ideas about how concretely we see Interreg could contribute. So first of all, we expect that uh, also the transnational cooperation programs are ambitious in their allocation to the Green Deal to allow a, a genuine climate action uh, which, which matters and uh, is visible in the upcoming period. Then, uh, since uh, transnational cooperation provides for a wide uh, framework, which overarches the whole cohesion policy, um, we see that programs and projects uh, should act as uh, transnational hubs, uh, which would then ensure links between the different transitions, but also links with topics uh, such as innovation, industrial uh, transformation, digitalization, skills, but also links with the key actors which need to be involved. Therefore, um, the cooperation projects, uh, in our um, uh, opinion, should strive to maintain their innovative and experimental um, vibe, uh, be it through uh, supporting demonstration projects, uh, pilots, uh, or commercial activities, which are um, likely then to offer the greatest scope for the rapid deployment of uh, new technologies, uh, which are, as we know, necessary for the transition to a greener climate uh, neutral economy. And finally, the transformation will not happen uh, without uh, participation. So participation is needed to ensure ownership of the actions and involvement of uh, the key actors I've mentioned. But it is also crucial to achieve critical mass to foster mutual learning, which then can release social innovation. So um, I believe that Interact's strength lies in the capacity to gather interested partners around a common challenge, but also in reaching out beyond the usual suspects and creating uh, new partnerships. So um, to conclude, I think at the end of the day, uh, the contribution of Interreg uh, to those strategic aims of uh, the European Union that I've mentioned uh, will uh, in fact lie with the capacity of the cooperation projects to act as innovation catalysts in the participating regions. And that is where our attention should focus I believe, uh, when uh, we develop, select, and implement uh, the Interact projects. Thank you very much, Carolina. This is indeed what we also had in mind when, when drafting the program. 
and the uh, uh, role of projects to be catalyst in the regions and in countries uh, links me to my next guest very nicely. And here I would like to invite Teresa Marcino. Teresa, hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, Dana. Good morning, everyone. Teresa is connecting uh, from Poland, Katowice. Is from right? Katowice, also great today. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Teresa, you were um, on top of your role mm -hmm. being member of the monitoring committee and the working group um, deciding the, the new generation of the prog program. You were also the chair of uh, the working group. So my first question would be to you, how did it go for you? And the second one, listening also to the commission, that um, the role of the programs is about the transition um, and uh, bringing change to region and uh, really enforcing the innovation. How does it translate now into the new program? So what is really the mission and vision that you have defined within uh, your programming exercise? Mm -hmm. um, to the first question, I have to say that um, um, it's not, um, it's not uh, something uh, unknown that uh, this program's logo is um, cooperation is central. And this reflects also um, the type of work we were doing and the way we were preparing the program. I like this program's logo because it, it has this meaningful pun in it. It means that cooperation is paramount, but on the other hand, it also says that uh, Interact Central Europe stands for good cooperation. And I can confirm that while preparing this program, this cooperation was really very good. And I refer here to both cooperation of uh, representatives of um, member states, but also to um, our dialogue with um, applicants, beneficiaries, stakeholders in all um, countries. So um, back to cooperation, transnational cooperation uh, is indeed central. Mm on the way to more resilient regions, offering their citizens uh, good conditions for working and living, which is uh, the mission of our program uh, in the next years. Um, the shape of the Interact Central Europe program for 2021-2027 uh, stems from many months of discussions, analysis, consultations, the question was um, not only about challenges um, to address in this very diverse um, area, but also um, it was a question about which of the challenges can be best addressed uh, uh, owing to transnational cooperation. Uh, all in all, uh, the new program puts emphasis on environmental issues, which is not very surprising, taking account of uh, circumstances um, and conditions uh, we are uh, now. Um, and um, of course, those issues uh, disregard any boundaries, so it was a natural choice for uh, main topic uh, of the program. Um, under this uh, priority, under this group of um, topics, energy transition and uh, circular economy solutions are among topics that could be or should be addressed. Uh, another important group of um, topics is linked to innovation uh, in a very wide sense. So as um, uh, Carolina mentioned, uh, transition, uh, also industrial transition uh, in better uptake of new technologies uh, will be uh, in the center uh, of the project, but we will also uh, see projects dealing with um, non-technological um, innovation. And this area may cover, may cover development of uh, new digital services, um, novel approaches to public services, including health, um, and also including responses to unexpected phenomena that are very often 
expected, uh, maybe expected uh, much often than before. Uh, under this non-technological innovation, we would also uh, create certain opportunities for projects relating to culture and tourism. They may also benefit from uh, the new uh, digital, digital solution and new approaches. Um, in the new program, cooperation uh, will be important uh, not only as a requirement to have three partners from different member states, but also, um, and also it was uh, already mentioned by Karolina, um, as a way of uh, interacting with the external world, external to project partnerships. Uh, so it will be important to involve local communities, stakeholders and organizations uh, to the activities of the project, to prepare for them solutions that really fit them. Uh, we have good examples uh, of this type of approach from current program, uh, to mention one related uh, to innovation. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, in now project brought together um, small uh, startups and big players, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs um, who deal in um, clean tech sector and um, offered them matchmaking services. Um, another uh, example of this participation um, could be um, quite a different project, um, Saluta 4C, uh, which involved uh, local communities uh, to create new green spaces in our gray cities. And speaking of uh, cooperation, it of course uh, takes uh, committed people and capable institutions uh, to, to, to bring good results. Therefore, I would like uh, to draw attention of our audience to our innovative proposals. Uh, priority number four, when we offer support uh, for those who want to cooperate. Um, I think that one, one more issue um, is worth mentioning uh, because there are a considerable, uh, there is considerable number of people who are just uh, meeting our program for the first time. I would like to, to encourage them and say that uh, also uh, for those who are a bit hesitant, uh, we designed this time special solution, small uh, projects that uh, will be offered at the later stage of the program, but uh, uh, that uh, is the instrument that may uh, facilitate onboarding to uh, transnational cooperation. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, also, special thanks that you have also named an example, uh, in the two examples of projects, and this leads me also to, to um, remind our audience that uh, if you are preparing a project proposal, please look around what is already there. There are certain uh, projects maybe also located near to you, and um, at our website uh, you will find uh, the projects that were supported from our program in the past, as well as uh, to look broader. Even in our documents, we are mentioning uh, different platforms uh, where you can check what is actually going on in your specific topic, in your specific team. Um, but also there was um, a lot uh, to say about the flexibility. And uh, now I would like to invite Christiane Bresnik, uh, our managing authority from City of Vienna, Hello, Christiane. Hello, Dana. Hello, Hi. also to the audience. Good morning. Nice to have you today with us. I, I was wondering when we are talking really about the flexibility and sometimes, you know, in the past we heard a lot about that Interreg is quite a complex task for people to manage. And we also heard on the other hand that uh, there is the aim to be more flexible and to simplify a lot of stuff. 
So uh, the, as the discussion is now basically over, what is actually, how it, does it translate to the program, uh, the flexibility and simplification? Can you share your thoughts with our audience? Yes, thank you, Dana. Thank you for giving me the floor uh, to this important topic. But first of all, I really would like to say, because when we prepared uh, in the preparation phase today in the morning, you told us that more than 1,400 people are here now on stage. I'm thrilled. And for me, this is also the biggest event ever. I had the possibility to speak. So hello to all the audience. But now to your question, of course, um, uh, it is very important uh, to cut red tape in the application phase and also for project implementation. And I must say that we did already a lot in the 1420 period, so in the current period. I just would like to um, point to, you know, we made application easier so that people had a better chance uh, that their application could be taken into the assessment. Then we introduced the electronic monitoring system, which was also a big help, and not to speak by a step-by-step -step switch from paper to digital. So less signature, less uh, snail mail, and more electronic signature and more electronic exchange. I think this speed up the processes a lot. I mean, of course, we could simply continue and improve what we already have, but we wanted this time to go a little bit beyond that uh, and to introduce also new features. Um, and uh, we had some ideas in the last month. Uh, I mean, the, the, the JS really prepared a lot of great ideas to, um, to introduce new, pro new process features, but we wanted to have a good feedback on that. So are we on the right track? And what we did was uh, that we addressed those people that actually have the experience. And this is uh, you, I mean, the beneficiaries. So what we did was to ask a focus group of very experienced beneficiaries, in most cases, lead partners, and presented them our ideas. And I must say, uh, say that this, this process was very, very valuable for us. I mean, we got so much important feedback and on the other hand, I must also say we had the feeling that they liked it a lot, that they were asked, that they could participate and that they could also bring in their experience that they were heard from the ground, because to be honest, they know exactly what's going on. And uh, you will hear uh, and read more today and also in our manual, what are the new features for simplification, but I just want to give you one or two examples of that. So. First of all, if we talk about application and project implementation, uh, you will see that the uh, work plan uh, and the work packages, the description are much more flexible. Of course, we want to know exactly what your project objectives are. We want to clearly know how you will develop your uh, outputs, but we do not need to know all the details how you will achieve this. So, uh, this will be much more flexible, it will be less fragmented, we will not ask you today what exactly you will do in three years. So this should give the partnership uh, more room to adjust the projects, uh, to also react to flexible situations that you will have in the timeline of the project implementation. As a second feature, and this might be very interesting for you from a financial point of view, is that we would like to disentangle the financial progress reports from the activity reports. So there will not be any more a joint progress report, but a joint financial report and a joint activity report. But not only that, we will cut the activity reports by half, meaning you will report in general on a six a monthly basis your expenditure, of course, uh, accompanied with the certificates of your national controllers, but you will only report every 12 months uh, jointly on your activities, which means uh, this will help a lot that you will be get reimbursed quicker and that your liquidity for the project partnership will be raised. So I think this is this might be good news, uh, the two, the two um, features for you 
there will be a lot uh, much easier in case you are you do some activities with state aid but this will be uh, explained to uh, to you in all the next uh, webinars tutorials and presentations that we will that you will have the chance now to listen because uh, what is for us important is we would like that you spend your resources mostly on getting the content, on getting your projects, on getting the results and outputs that you plan with your partnership and less on bureaucracy. Thank you very much, Cristiane. Indeed, content is the key. And um, with the, the time running, uh, I would still like to ask the question to the audience before I give the floor to Luca. And this is about uh, in which stage you are already now, because we are talking about the project development and being in a platform, maybe you join the platform, uh, but uh, the question on the poll that my colleague is opening just now is about uh, whether, you, whether you are already working on a project, concrete project proposal, which means you do not have to be the lead applicant, but you can also be a part of a consortia where uh, this development is already happening. And indeed, thank you all very much to be with us in such a good numbers. Uh, it shows that you are really interested in funding and we are very happy to share the initial uh, information with you. Right now I can see it's really 50-50. So many people are working already on a project proposals and many people are maybe just hesitant. Uh, for those of you who have not yet started, uh, the key message that we will probably repeat uh, three or two or three times uh, today is really start to use the community because it can be really the best place to start and uh, to look for partners. You can also search ideas and um, really interact uh, with people on the platform and uh, with the number of people joining the community going up and up even in the last hour we have seen that more than 100 people uh, registered as new members we are we are very proud that we can offer you such a tool but now back uh, Luca uh, uh, we I would like to invite you uh, Luca Ferrarese head of our secretariat you are going to share the key feature with our audience, and I believe you have a presentation to share. Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, and also very much uh, good morning to everybody from my side. And I will start immediately with sharing my screen and to talk about our first call for proposals. Let me just for a moment to share the screen and here it goes. So uh, yeah, I, I will present to you our first call for proposals. However, uh, I want to say that maybe we should not really look at it as our first call for proposals because at the end of the day, if you think back, there is a long tradition of cooperation in Central Europe. I mean, uh, transnational cooperation is uh, doing projects in Central Europe as from the 94-99 programming period. And next year, we will have 25 years of cooperation, transnational cooperation in Central Europe. So we, there are there out there, as already said also by Dana, many projects which are building bridges and reinforcing links between regions in Central Europe. They are, they are strengthening cohesion across uh, 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 borders across divides, all divides and emerging divides. Therefore, the message is please do not reinvent the wheel. Please look at what our projects are already doing and they have been doing in the past years. You can see on our website and you find in this slide some links. You will find a lot of information of existing projects uh, information on their outputs, on their results, the tools they produced, the knowledge they developed. And then I want also to point that there is another very nice tool, which is called keep.eu, in which you can surf through all the interact projects funded by all the programs in Europe. So there you will be able to filter uh, information and to get also to know which people are doing which projects. So you can start from there 
in building the content of your project, but also in looking for partners. This could be another good tool in order to, to, to build your partnerships. And now let's move on to the core basics. <clears throat> so our call, which it's more precise to say the first call of the new program is uh, uh, has no thematic focus. The call is open to all four program priorities and nine specific objectives. Where can I find information on these priorities and objectives? We had published already in June this year, a call preview in which we exactly pointed out information on what we are going to fund as it is written in our, in our program. So there you will find the information you want. And of course, I will not repeat today, otherwise we get too late. Um, then as a requirement, we have to have uh, transnationality. Our projects need to ensure that there is a true transnational cooperation funded through our funds. So in each project has to have at least three partners from three countries, out of which two can be, uh, should be from Central Europe and one can be also from outside. Um, then the approach of the call. Our call is organized in one step. What does it mean? It means that you have to submit the full project proposal in one shot. When we will close the call, you will have to fill in fully the application form. And then uh, on the basis of the full information, we will perform the assessment. Meaning that once the project is, uh, this step is accomplished, the projects are selected for funding and we start with the implementation. Um, the submission of proposals can happen only through our joint electronic monitoring system, which is also called GEMS. This is a system which is developed freshly new by the Interact program and will be, uh, uh, we will be one of the first using for a call for proposal. But I will tell you more later about it. Uh, what is the first step to be done when you plan to submit a project with us? You need to read the documents. And uh, since there are more documents, it's important also to point out where you can find things. So uh, uh, with this slide, I would like to present you the three main pillars you have to consider when reading documents. We have our Interact program. The Interact program is the legal basis, is the document that we uh, uh, drafted, so the member states prepared, and submitted to the European Commission. This was submitted back in June, and the document provides the challenges and needs of the program area. You will find a lot of information in this respect, which is also very useful for writing projects. You find the vision and the mission of the program, which is a little bit the, the, the lighthouse that the, all the projects have to think about and keep in mind when they are writing their proposals. Uh, you will find them for each program priority and each specific objective, detailed information on which topics are addressed, which actions with examples, what expected results uh, are, are to be produced by the projects, and which target groups and territories are addressed within each specific objective. Then, so the Interact program is already published until June, since June. Now, today, we are going to publish another two sets of documents. The first one is the program manual. The program manual is, so to say, the book of rules. <clears throat> it is organized in three sections, with the first section where you have common provision which apply to the entire project life cycle. Then there is a second section which is focusing on application. And the third section which is focusing on implementation with information reporting. So there you find all you need to know. It's a slim document. Let's say uh, one could argue what means slim, but however, nowadays, today it is around 90 pages. And I tell you, it's much slimmer than what it was in the past, thinking about also in the current and the previous programming period. So as Christiana said, we are always trying to simplify things and to be more to the point. What you find there, you find rules, you find procedures, you find requirements, you find key information you need to know. For example, there you, you will find very well explained the linkage between your project activities, your project results, 
and how your project results are contributing to the program results and to the indicators. This is key to be known when you are writing a proposal. You need to write your proposal having in mind how this proposal will contribute to the success of the program and the real change compared to the situation we have today in our area. You will find then guidance and you'll find, you will find also key documents. Just to mention two, you will find there the template of subsidy contract and partnership agreement. These two documents are key documents because they are establishing the legal relationship between the managing authority and the lead partner, and this is the subsidy contract, and then between the lead partner and all the partners, and this is the, subs the partnership agreement. Applicants need to know what legal obligations they are, they are going to enter if the project is funded. Therefore, as from the end of November, you will be able to download also these two key documents. The third set of documents of key importance is then the application package. What do you find there? You will find there, uh, described in the so-called term of reference of the first call, all the call-specific information, which goes beyond what is written in the manual. So you will find information on which kind of projects we are expecting to, to get from the first call, information on the call budget, uh, detail, more detailed information on the project selection process. You will find the templates, very importantly, the template of application form. And of course, you find the deadline for submission that I will tell you shortly. Um, the three documents are interlinked. We tried to the possible extent not to overlap information between documents in order to keep things a little bit shorter. So it's important, and we never stop repeating that you know all the three sets of documents, because in this way, you will find many answers to questions you might have. With the continuation of my presentation, I will focus now on the application package, a little bit telling you more about which uh, aspects you should consider for the first call. To start with, which projects are we looking for? We are looking for projects which uh, uh, have a partnership between five to 12 partners, a budget which is between 1.2 to 2.4 million euro of European Regional Development Fund, meaning between 1.5 and 3 million euro of total cost, and with a duration which is uh, up to 36 months. So uh, the question now could be, are these numbers written in stone? What if I have a project with 1.1 or 2.5 million euro ERDF. Uh, is it a problem? No, uh, these is our indicative numbers. Of course, uh, the size of the project, the duration of the project has to be related to the scope of the project. Therefore, if you plan, for example, to have a project lasting, lasting more than three years, you have to explain why it has to be obvious from the application form that you need more time. But more or less, this information you find in this slide is what we expect. This is, let's say, the, the type of projects we expect that, as said also by Christiane, are projects that nevertheless should be more flexible, more, let's say, easier to implement compared to the past. Um, talking about the budget, the budget allocated to the call is uh, indicatively 72 million with a breakdown per priority as presented in this table. And uh, this breakdown has been determined according to uh, the, the, the content of the priorities. It's obvious that in priority three and four, which have only one specific objective each, there is less budget than in priority two, which has five specific objectives. Um, just to remind all of us that the co-financing rate from the European Regional Development Fund is 80%. Uh, there is also the possibility in some countries to receive some national public co-financing. There are national funding schemes in some countries, therefore please uh, address your national contact point that they will tell you more about this. I want also to put ready now very clearly that if you get national fin financing and you are understated in the project, there might be some restrictions. 
Everything is very much explained in the program manual and you'll find all the information you need there. The next aspect, which is also defined in the term of reference for the call is project selection. I will focus now only on the quality assessment of the projects. Basically, uh, in our first call for proposals, there will be uh, the quality assessment performed in two phases. There is a first phase, which we call relevance filter, in which uh, some aspects of the strategic assessment and selection criteria listed in the program manual and detailed in the time of reference are applied. What are these aspects? We will look in particular to the contribution of the project to the program specific objective, as well as the clarity of its intervention logic, meaning how clear is the linkage between uh, challenge and needs, project actions, outputs uh, realized by the project and results achieved, and how these results are contributing to the program uh, objectives. Then we will look into the cooperation approach. The projects we are going to select must be through transnational cooperation. And of course, linked to that, we will look also at the relevance of the part of the partnership in terms of transnationality and competence. We do expect having the right people doing the right things in the project in order to address a concrete issue in the program area. Only projects that are showing an adequate quality under these specific aspects of the strategic uh, 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 selection criteria will go into the next step. The next step is called full assessment and under this uh, second phase of the assessment, there will be the verification and the analysis of the project proposals against the full set of strategic criteria, as well as against the operational criteria, meaning the methodology, the work plan, and the budget of the project. Um, at the end of this process, there will be a ranking list and the monitoring committee, which is the, that committee in which all member states are represented and the European Commission is with an observation role, uh, the monitoring committee will decide which projects will be ultimately funded. So uh, also looking at today, how many people we have and looking how many proposals or project ideas we have in the applicants community, I can already predict to you that there will be a lot of competition. So we really warmly invite you to do two things. First, to read carefully the assessment questions that you find in the term of reference for the call. Secondly, when you are developing your project proposal, uh, please perform a self-assessment. To help that, we prepared a self-assessment tool in which the assessment questions, which are in the term of reference, are turned into a checklist where you can say yes or no. Am I doing proper uh, 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 transnational cooperation, yes or no? And there, I would really warmly invite you to be very honest with yourself and try to see whether yourself, uh, your project has the chance to be funded. As I said, competition will be rather high. Uh, a focus on the application form template. We will provide an offline template, which is with two files. There is a first file in PDF, which contains for almost all text boxes that you have to fill in, also some guidance. You will find there very much uh, uh, interesting and detailed information, including tips on how and what you should fill in in each of the text boxes you have in the application form. We will then we have already then uh, made available to you, as from today, also a WAR file, which is fully open with no, with no protections. You can copy, you can change, you can do whatever you want, uh, which allows you to work from the beginning. And why this is needed? Because unfortunately, I have a bad news for you. Unfortunately, our GEMS, our monitoring system, is not there yet. It's a brand new system, which is developed by Interact. And the version we want to install in order to, to run our call will be unfortunately available only in January. Therefore, from now until when GEMS is available, you need to work offline with the word file. Unfortunately, this is not 
uh, the best solution, but I have to say we have no other solution than this one. And, uh, and therefore, that's why it's important to notice that between the template you have, you will download very soon. Uh, and what is in GEMS, there are small differences. These differences are not in the content of the application form as such, of course. But for example, in GEMS, you will have many sections which are interlinked. You fill in, for example, the budget in one part, and you will find the information in another part of the application form without retyping things. So I have to say that working in GEMS will be much easier than working with uh, uh, a Word file. But this is how it is, and uh, we count on, on your understanding. Uh, there is then the possibility to have, uh, uh, well, we have text boxes in which you will find information on what is compulsory in terms of duration, of size of the, of, the, of the text that you have to fill in, and what is recommended. What is the difference? I mean, again, this is linked to GEMS. Where it is uh, said, the text cannot be more than 1,000 characters. It means that you cannot technically type in one character more in GEMS. While when there is the, 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 the recommendation, the text size should be, uh, it is recommended to have not more than 1,000 characters. It means that technically speaking, you can type in more, but uh, uh, we believe that you don't need to say more than that. So if you have 5,000 characters and we recommend 1,000, it means that it might be enough. However, if you type more, nothing happens. The project is still okay. It's just a recommendation. And, and once more, to repeat, you cannot submit the application form as a Word file. You have to submit only through GEMS. Which support do we give to the applicants? We want to support you as much as we can. And when I say we, I mean not only the JS, but also the contact points. How do we do that? Through videos. And uh, for that, you will find uh, already available today, nine nice uh, 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 tutorials, which explain you what you have in the actions and activities within each specific objectives. But very soon, end of November, you will get also some tutorials on uh, the intervention logic and war plan. Uh, on finances, you will get two there, on state aid and on communication. As I said, this, these will come at the end of November. Uh, then one-to-one -one support, which is given by the contact points, uh, you will get already, you got already probably already now some, co some contacts with your network of contact points. As from end of November, we will also start what we call individual consultation. Uh, individual consultations means that each project proposal can receive one individual consultation with the, with the team of the JS in order to get general advices and, and inputs and answer to specific questions. Uh, we recommend you to do it when you have quite clear ideas on how your proposal will look like, because as I said, it is only one chance to get this consultation. Why? Because we need to offer the possibility to everyone to get a consultation. Therefore, it will be difficult to offer more than one to each proposal. Then we have Q&A. Uh, we have a, 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 an help desk established at the JS where you, address, you can address for general questions or also for technical questions, for example, for jams when it will be online. We have also an updated uh, section of FAQs on our website. This is available as from the end of November. And then very importantly, at the beginning of December, there will be a live Q&A session where you can type in directly live your questions and we will be there answering to you. Of course, it's worth having this session once you have already read all the documents that I mentioned before. And then, Together uh, with the self-assessment tool that I already mentioned, there are other complementary tools. We have a nice project summary generator, which is helping you defining your project summary, which sometimes is a little bit complicated to do. Uh, and then, especially, especially for private lead applicants, you will have the possibility to check the compliance with the requirements that are set for private lead applicants with uh, the so-called financial capacity check tool, meant to check, as I said, the financial capacity and financial viability 
of this uh, particular category of lead applicants. Again, these tools shall not be submitted to us. They're just for you. Uh, what is going on then? At the national level, there are various national uh, uh, support activities. You see in this slide, the four info days, which are already scheduled in four countries, and more will come very soon. Please check regularly on our website for updates. And now the call, the call timeline. The call opens today. The call will close us on 23rd of February, which means 100 days count, counted from today to the 23rd of February. What happens in between? On 29th of November, we will open up the possibility to have the individual consultations I told you before. This possibility will be kept until the 11th of February, 2022. Then uh, on 2nd of December, there will be the live Q&A session that I mentioned where you can post your questions and we will answer live. Everything will be recorded and also this live Q&A will be then available on the video session of our website. And then, uh, we count to put GEMS online in January. Uh, what we can assure you is that from when we have GEMS online to when the call closes, you will have at least three weeks. What does it mean? It means that if, you, if for whatever reason, which is not depending from us, GEMS will be delayed, in turn, our call closure will be delayed in order to ensure you enough time to fill in what you have in Word file to shift and to copy and paste into GEMS. So we believe that in three weeks, you can do that. And with this, I think I'm, I'm, I have concluded just an, a last word. I wish you really to work and put your best effort in creating great projects, because I think there is a lot of knowledge out there and there were many efforts done by our member states in making the best program possible with the limited funds we have. So now is your turn, good work, and we see each other afterwards, hoping with great proposal, proposals approved by our monitoring committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, we have been following the chat and thank you very much for being active in the chat and in the questions as well. And uh, Luca, you can uh, maybe stay with us and turn on your cameras because there are a few questions already uh, to be answered by you, I believe. I mean, uh, it is now clear that we are opening the call today. And if you go to our website, you will find a full page with all the documents that you need. Um, nevertheless, I have the first question from uh, Giuseppe Olmetti, and he's asking about, can a proposal be presented as a sum of combination of aims and actions based on two different priorities, or is it better to focus only on one? I mean, <clears throat> a proposal has to focus clearly to one priority and not only to one priority, to one specific objective. It has to be focused on that. Of course, there are connections with topics addressed under other priorities. However, uh, you have to write your proposal showing clearly the direct link between what is your project planning to do and what is the program expecting to receive under that specific objective? So the answer is one proposal, one SO per project. Perfect, thank you very much. The next one that we can cover is um, uh, Rachel Surani is wondering whether it is possible to apply within the same call with several different projects by the same company or consortium. Uh, there are no limitations on that, and therefore it's, 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 let's say, rather normal that one organization might be involved in more projects. But however, please keep in mind your capacity, because to be part of more projects means a lot of effort. So uh, the recommendation I can give you is to prioritize. Prioritize what is the most important for you, for your organization, for your uh, for your mission in the in the program area. Therefore, of course, the answer is yes, this is possible. You can be part of more proposals, but also a piece of advice, be focused. 
Indeed. The next one from Tomaso Musner is about, do we have to present some documents, information in advance to organize individual consultations? So for the individual consultation that start end of November, is there a document uh, the applicants need to um, present? Uh, of course, as you see in our applicant community, you can post project ideas. We need to have uh, information on your project idea in order to prepare best our individual consultation. What we don't want to see is your application form because it has to be clear that individual consultation is not an assessment. We are not assessing your project at that point. Uh, consultation is a consultation. We advise you, we give you recommendations which are tailored to your needs. That's why we need to know what is your project about, but we don't assess your project at that point. Wonderful. We have also a question, a question about the preparation costs and whether they are eligible, Luca. Yes, they are. Good news. They are eligible and they are reimbursed with a lump sum meaning that uh, to those projects which are successfully uh, 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 submitted and which are then funded by the program monitoring committee and started their implementation, they will get a nice amount of 17,500 euro of total cost, which is uh, 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 as a lump sum reimbursement of preparation cost. What does it mean? It means that you don't have to show ticket of, of travels or, or, or pay slips or anything, it's just a lump sum. It gives you an amount you don't have, you have just to apply for that. Please, if you plan to have to, to, to receive a, a lump sum for preparation costs, you have to include it in the application form. More information can be found in the menu. We also have a question about the second call. And the question is whether it will be open next year. Um, well, this is a good question, meaning that uh, we aim to, let's say, have the project selection of the first call by the end of next year. Uh, but this very much depends how many proposals we receive. Let's hope that we will manage to have it. And the plan is to open, to launch the second call when we have information on the first call selection, because then we can better shape the call to, to what is the experience of the first call. So yes, uh, we are planning to launch the call end of next year, but with a little question mark. Uh, we have Francisca Dietrich and she's asking about are finance reports mandatory for every partner every six months or can partners also decide to submit a finance report only once a year? Um, let's say you have to look at the project level and the project level, we do expect every six months to receive a finance report, even because the more certificates you produce to us, the more, the quicker we can pay to you and we activate the, 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 the you know, the financial flows. Uh, then a partner might also, for whatever reason, to submit, uh, to, not to submit a financial report in that year, but it will not get money at that point. So we recommend you to, to spend in time, to submit in time your costs to your controller and to report every, every six months because financial reporting is easier than content reporting. Perfect, thank you very much. I can also invite you to post question also to the speakers uh, we talked to at the beginning of the event. So feel free also to ask questions and maybe Christiane, the managing authority, you, would you like to comment on the, the questions that were already um, asked? Uh, yes, um, basically, I think that Luca already answered uh, most of the questions uh, in detail. I just wanted to complement a little bit the second question uh, where uh, a, a participant of the event asked if you, know, you can uh, be involved in multiple applications. And as Luca correctly said, yes, this is true, but I would like to just make you aware that uh, one of the tasks of the member states and the managing authority in JS is also to check the, uh, the capacity of the partnership and of a single uh, 
project partner in implementing a project. And I just want to let you know that together with the national contact points, we are rather going into detail on that. So if a small institution with, uh, with four or five people is uh, involved in, 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 in 10 projects, uh, this will pop up and this will be discussed and this might not be really of the benefit for the application. So as Luca correctly said, uh, focus and see what is really your strength in which partnership in, and, and in which uh, thematic uh, content. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Christiane, for adding this important information. Uh, we also have a question about uh, the starting date of the project. So if the project is successful and um, when can people actually expect to start the activities? I don't know, Luca, do you want to comment on this one too? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, as I said, it depends how long it will take for the selection, but the plan at the moment is to have the project selection before the end of the year so that projects know that they are funded before the end of the year and they can start the implementation in January 2023. So this is our expectation and this is what we are striving for. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I, I would like to not just thank you that you were asking the questions, but also we, we need to um, watch a little bit the time. And uh, we do not want to miss an important uh, presentation of a project that is actually with us or with a project promoter who is actually, um, who knows why cooperation is central. And I believe she is already eager to tell us why cooperation is central for her university in Wismar, as well as she already has some inspiration for you when developing the projects. But before I do, I'll give the floor to Laima Gerlitz. Uh, do not worry about the questions that were not yet answered. We try to do it in written in a chat. And I would also like to repeat that there will be a webinar early December where we the specifically deal with all the details and uh, will be actually answering all your questions because the name of the webinar is Q&A webinar. But now, uh, Laima, thank you very much for joining us from Bismar, Germany, right? Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Dana. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will try to share now my slides. I hope everybody can see them. Um, I will try to be uh, as brief as possible because I know that um, um, time is money and um, now after this uh, very informative workshop, everybody will uh, try to do their best. So um, again, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm Laima Gerlitz. I'm uh, representing our Wismar Business School from University of Applied Science in Wismar, uh, located in the northern part of Germany at the Baltic Sea. Um, uh, so um, probably uh, you could not uh, have chosen, let's say, more uh, representative from uh, more outermost uh, region. Um, nevertheless, uh, we are very happy uh, to be part of the project um, and program, and uh, we believe that uh, for collaboration, the distance doesn't matter. Um, and um, uh, I think this is a very good opportunity uh, for us uh, to participate also in this program. And also, uh, it gives us opportunity to act also as a gateway, a broker, let's say, to, to the Baltic Sea region and uh, transfer also very good ideas um, to uh, any uh, other interact programs. Um, when it comes to transnational collaboration, uh, and we have seen from, uh, from, the from the previous presentations, Usually it's not um, easy uh, to understand this, let's say, technical um, program language. Um, and it's more difficult uh, if we have a very brilliant idea, 
that is acknowledged by um, several um, regions and partners and is uh, very promising. Nevertheless, uh, we have to, to bring it uh, into the frame of the, of the technical language. Um, and it's usually, uh, I would say from, from our own experience is the highest uh, challenge that we um, usually uh, face. Um, we are here all for the same uh, purpose and the common denominator for us, um, I would say it's uh, the cooperation. And our desire is of course to be uh, on the top of the slide and just uh, um, to kickstart uh, our cooperation in the frame of the project to implement our project idea. Um, start meeting uh, project partners, uh, bringing changes to our region, but um, nevertheless, sometimes the reality uh, might bring us back uh, to the bottom, and uh, we need to uh, start from from the scratch. It, it meaning does not mean that uh, we need uh, to start our project idea development for those who are, let's say. Um, stars in the <laughs> transnational cooperation, um, more or less, uh, they know how to how to prepare. But nevertheless, with each new um, call launched, uh, with each new program, we need to check. As so it, it is well, so already several times uh, said, we need to check uh, the regulations. We need to check the conditions. We need um, to apply. This is very uh, important uh, step. And um, sometimes um, when we prepare the projects, of course, we are very um, idealistic uh, and optimistic. We expect that what we have planned, um, it will be uh, achieved as it is uh, on, on the paper, on the project application and a strategic document. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, we must uh, also take into account, at least this is from our experience, um, that uh, um, we will face uh, changes, uh, we will face um, adjustments uh, that will be needed to either when preparing the project application, for example, when we have the consultation, national consultation or the consultation that it's offered by GS. Um, then we need to make adjustments uh, and adaptations. Uh, but this does not need to uh, necessarily stop us because with each uh, step we are moving forward, we are also improving um, our project uh, idea and making it more feasible. And um, one of the also most important, uh, let's say, not lessons, but I would say experiences that uh, was re uh, reconfirmed during the last years of cooperation is that um, sometimes we forget that we what we work with uh, with people. Um, it's not only about technical implementation of cooperation, and uh, we also need to be ready to to compromise uh, the needs, the interest, and do not forget that each of the regions or each of our partner organizations have different uh, different culture and different understanding. Uh, that's why most, I would say, one of the highest challenges uh, to find the common ground, the common de denominator for, first of all, internal um, cooperation within the project team and uh, build up a project uh, organizational culture, which also needs uh, quite a certain um, time. Um, but culture is it's very important issue also uh, in projects and uh, uh, we should keep this um, in mind. So from our own experience, uh, what um, recommendations, uh, what implications I could share, it's uh, first of all, that we must be self-confident and believe uh, in ourselves. Uh, it does not matter if we are small, <laughs> even small uh, matters. Um, and um, we should believe in, in our idea, even uh, especially if we have the recap of our uh, policy makers and um, uh, community. Um, it means that uh, also it's, it's not necessarily needed that we must be 
professionals in transnational cooperation and have a very high record of projects already implemented. Um, our organization, uh, me, myself, I also uh, started with the project idea having no experience um, in Central uh, Euro program, but this does not, didn't prevent me, let's say, to stop. Um, in addition, uh, I would say it's very important to have um, the shared understanding of what we aim to achieve in our project, as well as um, be ready uh, to bridge um, knowledge from, from different disciplines. I think nowadays it's very important also to work uh, across disciplines and um, involve different stakeholders into the project. Uh, furthermore, uh, I already briefly mentioned this, it's very important uh, also to engage uh, socially into the project, into the uh, partnerships. Uh, networking uh, is an um, essential step in um, finding project partners, and I think this Interreg um, Central Europe community is a very good tool, uh, especially for those who have not, let's say, a big track of projects already. Uh, empathy is uh, the same important issue as, as culture, and uh, we must bear in mind that uh, we uh, might have different understanding of issues, uh, but it's very uh, important also to talk about this uh, during the preparation uh, stage of the project proposal. Um, and I think it might be also essential before uh, starting uh, project itself. Uh, meeting expectations um, of involved stakeholders is also uh, as an essential um, step or precondition for project success. Um, from our own experience, um, I could share that um, we used to have very good, uh, brilliant ideas, but even our, uh, but if our project uh, idea does not reach uh, the community itself, um, the cooperation is um, uh, not so uh, valued at the end uh, of the day. Uh, we must also make it clear that uh, local communities uh, are also involved and participating in the region, in the uh, project, and they are ready also to, to accept the change that we aim to introducing with our projects. Um, and last, uh, last but not least, um, I think that um, e even if we do not succeed with our project idea, project proposal it does not mean that we are um, bad. It means that uh, we have uh, other opportunities that we might use, um, which also means that uh, if not maybe in, in this kind of program, the project idea can uh, survive and, and be reused, capitalized on um, in other forms of um, cross-border or transnational cooperation. Um, to conclude my brief presentation, um, I would share um, the citation that uh, it's very important to prepare. And uh, I think this was already mentioned several times today. Um, the most important step for preparation is, of course, uh, getting acquainted with, uh, with the documentation and using opportunities and um, for cooperation as well as consultations offered. There, there are so many um, good opportunities uh, either to exchange uh, on the local, national, or transnational level. And uh, I think it's very um, useful to use um, them and, and to make it best uh, to prepare projects uh, for the future cooperation and, and belief in, uh, in yourself. So this would be uh, all from my side. So uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here available and uh, hope to see you soon again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Laima. Especially thank you that you also mentioned the local level and the participation of uh, the communities that are needed 
Uh, so maybe you already have your experience uh, how your past projects was doing it. And it was also really enforced by the European Commission. And this is also the important part of Interact Project doing this job. So would you be, would you be able to maybe just share uh, with us how it, uh, with a concrete example of yours, how did it go uh, with your project that you were involved in? Um, yes, I, I mean, I cannot give maybe the final or let's say the, the best example of this, but um, again, if we are so in this uh, project language, this technical implementation, then we usually forget to involve, let's say, our local communities. And uh, how we, uh, let's say, uh, tried to, um, uh, to improve the situation in our projects we were involved, we tried uh, always to plan and implement uh, local uh, workshops. It means uh, making um, uh, or raising public awareness, uh, in involving um, organizations to the meeting using our university uh, channels and networks, because they are already, let's say, uh, very um, professional in, in knowing how to engage local communities. And, and sometimes it takes also a lot of, uh, let's say, not time, but efforts that we uh, forget uh, to translate, let's say, the project language into uh, local communities understanding. I mean, I understand that the programs uh, require that we must fit uh, into this priorities, um, uh, output description, uh, but uh, on the one hand, it, it becomes very technical. And on the other hand, um, fitting uh, the program, we uh, somehow miss this link or miss, uh, um, the ability to, to broker to local communities or local people. And then uh, it's very important also, let's say, to, to, to leave the project scope and scale and try to look uh, what we are doing from, from the outside perspective. And for that, even if we don't have, let's say, our own resources, we can use uh, the resources that are offered either by the program or involve, involving external experts who are very good, uh, let's say, in communication and making uh, um, understanding of, um, or let's say, translating difficult topics into very simple language. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, in the chat, I actually see a lot of questions directed at the technical level of uh, the call, uh, but maybe one is about the university being the lead partner, uh, which actually is uh, the case also for, for Lima. So if you, uh, if you are going to apply, uh, you will be probably the lead applicant and you are the university, which is uh, possible. But looking at the time and having a few minutes, uh, if it is fine for you, I would like to now uh, still ask you questions uh, of our audience. And uh, let me start with the first one on the top right now. Will the project be evaluated only against other project uh, proposal within the specific objectives or against all proposal within the priority? And I believe Luca or Christiane would like to uh, respond to this one, right? Yeah, I can answer. Um, the, the assessment and then the selection is performed <clears throat> on, uh, at, let's say, at the priority level, not at the specific objective level. So as you see, we have availability of funds per, uh, uh, per uh, priority, and we will have then the selection within the, the, the same priority, but not at a specific objective level. Thank you. There's a question uh, about the need to make partners sign the partner declaration with their budget as it was in the past programming period. Luca. Yes, there will be part of the application package. There will be also the uh, lead partner and partner declarations. They need to be signed as it was in the past. However, there is a novelty. Uh, there, you don't need to put, we are already going to the technical level huh, here. And 
you don't need to put the amount of co-financing because there will be a, a sentence saying the amount is as written in the application form. This is simplifying a lot the work of the people preparing the projects because then you don't need to correct manually the, the declaration just before submitting because meanwhile the budget change in the application form. So we believe a small thing which helps a lot in simplifying the life of the people. And of course, these uh, documents can be signed also electronically, depending on whether these documents are meet this, sorry, the, the electronic signature is meeting the European standards on that. You will find more information in the menu. Perfect. We have a question about our program approach regarding the private entities. So although eligible in 2014, 2020, it seems that they weren't that favorable compared to public bodies. Well, let's put it in this way. There is no special uh, uh, judgment on whether one is public or private. It has to be relevant to the project and that's it. So uh, if the private partner has uh, a good reason for being the partnership, it's fine. However, this is not a program in which we are focusing on funding uh, 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 business or funding on funding uh, uh, productive uh, investments. We are focusing more uh, on a mission which is of public, let's say, uh, nature. However, we could see in the current program that we have 20% of private of private partners participating. So there is no particular uh, uh, prevention against the privates. They are welcome. They have to, to, to find their way to be part of it. And another novelty is that the privates can be lead partners in all priorities. While in the previous programs, they were, uh, uh, they were allowed to be lead partners only in the priority innovation which is priority one. So this is a novelty of the new program. Uh, Christiana, do you want to uh, complement the answer maybe? I saw that maybe you wanted to jump in. Um, yes, actually, but to the to the question before on the uh, on you know if the if the budget uh, the co-financing budget has to be included in the application form for the partners, uh, as as Luca already said, there will be a link to the budget uh, to the co-financing which will be the application form and then in gems. So in order not to have these uh, these changes, then if a budget changes uh, after after. Um, uh, you know, some amendments. However, it must be clear that with signing the, uh, the application form as a project partner, you also legally commit yourself to your national co-financing, even though the amount is not specifically written there. I think this must be also crystal clear to applicants. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question about part but partners outside of Central Europe area. And is a German partner outside of Central European area uh, allowed to be part of, of uh, project consortia? Yes, it is allowed. Uh, I mean, the German partner outside the program area is a very special case, like it could be also for, Ital for Italy, where we have the program covering only part of the country. So uh, in this case, they are called assimilated partners and they can be part of the project partnership as such. So there is no particular limitations. Okay, thank you very much. And Luca, stay on please, because there will be the last question for today's session. And you were talking about assimilated partners and people are also asking about associated partners. So are they relevant for the application form is the question. Yes, they are relevant. They should be the key stakeholders. So those people which are especially interested in project results. Uh, however, we don't expect to receive any letter of adhesion or interest to the project. We are not uh, asking you to collect that. What you have to do is to provide information in the application form with 
contact details of these people. Uh, another message is that doesn't it's not important to have many listed to impress us there. It's important to have the right ones listed there because you need to have the right people. And if you let me just uh, correct something on my previous answer on the private lead partners, I wanted to also uh, specify that differently from the past, the private lead, lead, uh, lead applicants do not need to provide any longer a financial guarantee, which was uh, rather complicated and costly, especially for some in some countries. So this is no longer a requirement. There are other requirements to be fulfilled, you will find in the manual, but this one is no longer there. And then I would like also to correct myself. I said that in the 1420 program, lead partners were possible only in priority innovation, but in reality, in the 1420, they were also possible in other priorities. It was in the previous one that uh, it was not possible, but you know, we have a long tradition of cooperation. So sometimes I can make some mistakes. Sorry for that. No problem at all. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, let me just uh, uh, give you three take home messages for the next three months when you are going to work on your project proposal. So first of all, uh, you can go to our website and already there you can find all the documents that you need. Please carefully read them and um, check what is maybe write down your questions already start to do it now. Uh, there will be a support coming, which is already my second, second message for you, that the support the program offers is there for you. So it's the Joint Secretariat and National Contact Points uh, organizing events in the next weeks and months to come. And plus, uh, be active, my third message, in the community, because this applicant community is for you to also use. You can... You can right now after this event, uh, when it is um, when we are finished, you can really explore what the platform has in store for you. We have been mentioning a lot about individual consultation and project ideas. You uh, can post project ideas in the community. So thank you very much for joining us and good luck for your project preparation. Bye. <laughs>